All right. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> And uh, thank you for joining us today for a special Authors Uncovered event presented by Sacramento Public Library. My name is Rivka Sass, and uh, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we bring uh, Madam Secretary and Donna Apodoni out. We also know that uh, we've got folks entering the room right now. So uh, with no further ado, I want to uh, um, just welcome you and say that we're absolutely thrilled that we were able to uh, pull this event together in a, a rather short time and thrilled to host former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright uh, for a conversation about her latest book, Hell and Other Destinations. Uh, this, is, this is what we do at the library and we're going to figure out how to do it even with social distancing. So um, I want to make sure that you also know um, a, a few things that you need to know to be comfortable for tonight. So please look around you and find the nearest uh, exit, if you could do that. And also the restrooms are over there and over there and behind me. So um, make sure you know where they are. Whoops. And sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I am uh, also going to move forward and welcome a couple of our library uh, library board members. The chair of the Sacramento Public Library Authority, Sue Frost, is here, and uh, Citrus Heights Council Member Jeff Slowey should be coming into the room, and so we want to thank them as well for their support. And um, now I want to make sure that you hear all the good stuff, and then I'll be quiet, and we'll bring Secretary Albright out with Donna Apodoni. So we want to make sure that you know that whether it's a one-of-a-kind experience like tonight, and it's going to be one of a kind because we're using a platform, Crowdcast, that's brand new to us. So if we have a few glitches, please just bear with us. Uh, we want to make sure that you also know that we have digital story times going on. I hope that you have seen some of our very talented librarians delivering those virtual book clubs. And uh, we also do happy hour. So that's a pretty cool thing. And we believe that connecting with our community is absolutely critical, especially in these challenging times. For those of you who participated in various conversations we've held over the last year, you we wanna make sure that you know and that you pass on the fact that our virtual doors are always open. Uh, I also wanna mention that we will be starting curbside delivery uh, very soon, uh, piloting it in a couple of libraries, but I'm only going to tease you and not tell you where just yet. So before, uh, again, additional housekeeping items, no food or drink is allowed in the Galleria. So please remember that. If you want to post a chat in Crowdcast, your comments are public. So make sure that uh, you're kind uh, in the chat and um, be respectful of that feature. You can also pose a question. Uh, there should be an ask a question button at the bottom of your Crowdcast screen. There's also closed captioning available. There, you should see a, a tablet that says click here for closed captioning. So that's another uh, service that we are trying to uh, uh, to offer you tonight, so we'll see how it goes. The other thing that you all should know about is that the event is being uh, streamed live on Facebook. You can find us at SAC Library on Facebook as well as Instagram and Twitter. A recording will be made available after the broadcast on our website. And um, we hope that you're all signing up for summer reading because we're doing it a little bit early this year. So if you've got kids, make sure they sign up and are reading and you yourself can sign up and reading. Pri prizes will be announced later, but we did something really cool, we think, for tonight. You can earn a special summer reading badge for attending tonight's event by logging the code ALBRIGHT in the special guests activity track at saclibrary.beanstack.com. 
www.albrightmedia.org. So that special code is Albright, and you can indicate that um, you can indicate that you were here with us. If you haven't read uh, uh, Secretary Albright's book, you can pick up a signed copy from our official local bookseller, Face in a Book, um, and. We are also, I think we have some signed uh, book plates that go with those books if purchased from there. So um, we're, we're excited about that. We have to thank our good friends at HarperCollins. They are responsible for bringing us, uh, bringing us this amazing event with Secretary Albright, and we're really very thrilled about it. So with no further ado, thanks for, Thanks for um, letting me go through all of that. And now I am going to bring the secretary and Donna Apodoni on stage. And don't mind me as I figure this out. Whoops. No, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear my wonderful um, tech guy? And then Donna. Hey. Hello, Madam Secretary. Hello, hello. And I'm bringing Donna on. And I am indeed here. I have Thank to you, say Rivka. something. And, and now that you, we're all here together, I want to say how lucky we are to have Donna Apodoni um, here. For those of us who are tried and true uh, CAP Radio fans, she's the voice we love to hear in the morning. Many of us have been waking up to Donna for years, and she's been uh, she's been host of Cap Radio's Morning Edition since 2001, and Cap Radio Reads since 2013. Donna's been addicted to radio since the age of 14, when she visited a family friend at a Cleveland radio station, and um, we all know how hard she works and how much she does for us, and we're so glad that she made the switch from commercial radio to public radio because she truly is a local treasure. So uh, thank you, Donna, and welcome. And everybody, if we could applaud, we would be giving Madam Secretary a standing ovation for coming all this way to Sacramento. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. I have the honor of introducing Secretary Albright, having read this new book, called Hell and Other Destinations and a couple of the other books that she's written, I started to put together uh, a list of the qualities that this person must have to do the work that she's had. We know her as Secretary of State, U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Professor at Georgetown University, Chair of a global strategy firm, and a lot more. And the honors, the list of honors she has received is long. So the list of qualities, of Madeleine Albright could have been a very long list, but I realize it actually is summarized in just three. Just three. I, I think everything falls into purpose, passion, and humor. And we're going to delve into all three of those tonight and, and let her share with you how those work in her life. Madam Secretary, welcome. Well, it's great to be with you, Donna, and with this wonderful uh, virtual audience. Uh, I'm looking forward to this and I'm looking forward to your questions and having a good time. Well, first of all, happy birthday. It's Friday. Friday is your birthday? Yes, Friday is my birthday. Yeah. Well, happy birthday. And oh, are you, you at home? Are we seeing you in your home environment? I am at home in Georgetown. Um, okay. This is my uh, working office. Uh, where I uh, work on those things that you're talking about, but especially my teaching things. I have kind of, I have to say, uh, a library of a complete um, person that does nothing but international relations of every kind. Um, it's kind of the perfect international relations uh, uh, library in many ways. You are wearing a pin that I have to ask you about because you're famous for your pins. You've written about your pins. Everyone asks you about them. How did how did it get to be a practice of yours to wear pins? Well, let me tell you, I clearly like jewelry. Um, and I uh, go to the United Nations in February 1993. And it was after the end of the Gulf War. And the, the uh, ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. And I was an instructed ambassador. And my instructions were to make sure that the sanctions stayed on. 
So I said perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. And so um, soon there was a, a poem that appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. And so I happened to have a snake pin, and I decided to wear it when I talked about Iraq. And then I think people probably know that after a session of the Security Council, there's always press um, out there waiting. And I came out, and one of the cameras turned, and the uh, reporter said, why are you wearing that snake pin? And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry to reflect what I thought we were going to do on any given day. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, I uh, wore a lot of carnivorous animals and spiders and things. And the other ambassadors would say, what are we going to do today? And I said, read my pins. And that's how it all started. Which was at the same time that President Bush was saying, read my lips, right? Exactly. Sort of that same, well, right after yeah. That. yeah, no, yeah. And that, that's I copied, actually. Um, and so, so the, my, pin you're, the pin you're wearing tonight looks like a V. Well, I'll tell you, I initially, by the way, uh, I uh, was uh, going to wear a different pin throughout this whole saga. I was going to, I had this devil that I thought went well with hell and other destinations. Yeah. Uh, but given what's going on, I kind of thought that this would be useful. But let me explain why I wore it, because... I write about this in the book in turn, I didn't write about the virus, but I wrote about World War II because I was a little girl during World War II and we spent the war in London during the Blitz. My father was a uh, Czechoslovak diplomat and he was working with the government in exile there. And his job was to broadcast over BBC into Czechoslovakia. Uh, and I'd listened to BBC and I remember this to this day, the BBC broadcasts would begin uh, with a kettle drum roll of the first notes of Beethoven's fifth, da 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 dum, which in Morse code means victory. Um, and so I thought, victory, uh, we need victory over the virus. Um, and so that's why I decided this was a good pin to wear now for uh, as I talk about my book. Well, good. And I'm wearing a book. My pin is a book this evening. So well, great. it all fits together. Yeah, yeah, right. Everybody wears their pins, I think, when they come to hear you. One of the <laughs> things I, right? One of the things I like about your books, having read a few of them, is the way you flow in and out of some serious political uh, explanation in history and and uh, talk about what you have done and, and the others around you. And then you'll flow right into something that's very light, like, let me tell you what happened at dinner. And the flow is so easy to read and so enjoyable that all of your books are, are just a real joy. You wrote that when you wrote your first book, thinking that might be your one and only memoir, Madam Secretary, you asked for some advice from was it from gabriel garcia marquez yes right what well, what kind of advice did he give well, you? let me tell you i mean let me just preface that by saying that i think people that have been public officials in many ways owe it to write a book because um then you write about what you did and the various events that took place and you obviously do it from your perspective but then researchers read other books also and can really find out what happened and so when I think public officials don't want to write books, I think it is a loss in terms of, of history. So what happened, and I, I don't mean to be obnoxious about this, but I was down in Colombia um, uh, when I was um, secretary, actually, um, at, a, at a very important meeting uh, in Cartagena. And I had met Gabriel Garcia Marquez earlier at a state dinner, and we began to talk about things. And so he was at this meeting that I was having with the president of Colombia, Pastrana at the time. And then we walked around Cartagena and he told me exactly where all the places in Love in the Time of Cholera took place, which in itself was just the most incredible uh, treat. So then he said to me, I, I hope you write your memoirs at some point. And I said, I probably will. And he said, let me give you a piece of advice. Do not be angry when you write your memoir. And I think it's a very important message, frankly, because you get over being angry and or um, 
whatever, but I think that it's it it's one of the best pieces of advice I got. And so I I tried to tell what I had done in a calm way. I did also, as you pointed out, I tried to put what I write about into historical context because usually there's some reason why uh, a diplomat has taken a particular position that has to do with the history of either what your own country did at the time earlier or what the country that you're dealing with. And so having that historical context, I think is very important. The title though, Hell and Other Destinations, sounds a little angry. What's behind well, that? Well, um, I'll tell you what started out, and again, mostly I, um, uh, write about things that happened to me. And one of the things that I found when I first started out uh, as, a, as a young woman who was trying to figure out what to do, I just had twins and uh, I was uh, had thought I should go back to school and, and all of a sudden I was being criticized by other women. And I do think that uh, women are very hard on each other. Um, and so they would, some of the women would say, why aren't you at home with your children? And you should, why are you going to school or not in the carpool line? And besides my hollandaise sauce is much better than yours. And I thought to myself that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other, which is what the original title, uh, that's what it's about. And it's something, I think it's probably the most famous thing I ever said. It ended up on a Starbucks cup. Uh, but uh, it didn't occur to me because, as I said, I wrote the book before the virus that it would be such an apt title at the moment. Uh, but it's a it's a kind of a reprise of a statement that I had made earlier. And uh, a lot of good titles had already been taken, but I thought that that would make it a pretty good title. Isn't it interesting with all you've done in your life, making it to a Starbucks cup is what people remember. <laughs> Never know. Yeah, never know. Well, you have written in this that it, when you look at current events, you tend to put yourself in that place of the Secretary of State and say, what would I do if I were Secretary of State now? So I have some questions for you. Okay. Yeah. okay. First of all, because I work for an NPR affiliate, I would like to ask you to comment on Secretary Pompeo's treatment of NPR's uh, Mary Louise Kelly taking her into um, his office. Well, let me just say, if I could put that a little bit into context, everything, uh, things that one gets used to, frankly, as a public official, I already mentioned the press corps at the United Nations. Uh, but one of the other things that does happen when the Secretary of State or the UN ambassador travels, you take press with you. Um, and it's interesting and you get to know the press very well uh, it's a very funny relationship, actually, because on the airplane, you talk and have a nice time and, and to get to know each other. Then you get off the plane, and all of a sudden, the journalists start asking you hard questions, uh, which is their job. And then you all go out to dinner anyway. But it's a very kind of uh, interesting relationship. And just parenthetically, I had always wanted to be a journalist. Um, and so I have a great respect for journalism and journalists and the freedom of the press. Um, I think, however, it um, what Pompeo has been doing, he's just following what the president does, which is to insult the press um, and make them feel like it's an imposition or that it's fake or that it's uh, something that is not an essential part of a democracy, is to have a free press that is able to ask the questions um, and be able to get answers. Now, it doesn't mean that every answer that um, a public official gives um, is perfect. And often, and I have to say in my own case, I regret some answers that I have given. Uh, but I do think that treating the press with respect for the job that you all have, I think is absolutely essential for a democracy. In the situation we're in now with the pandemic, the people who are the people you just mentioned, President Trump, Secretary Pompeo, are in a position to really bring nations together. 
it seems like this would be an ideal time since the whole world is going through this pandemic together. This could be a time for all nations to come together to try to find solutions. If you were still in the position of Secretary of State, what might you recommend? Well, definitely, I believe what you just said is that it is a time to bring people together Mainly, the virus knows no borders. Um, and, and it is one of those issues that requires um, multilateral action. By the way, I know Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has sent too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But basically, it's just partnerships. And um, there are certain problems that you cannot solve by yourself. And a pandemic is right up there. Climate change is another nuclear proliferation, a space policy, a number of different aspects. Um, and I think that um, it is the responsibility of the, any president of the United States to care, take, take care of the people um, the, uh, and the territory and our way of life. That's, that's what a president's supposed to do. I would interpret it, and I worked for two presidents who felt the same way, President Carter and President Clinton, that basically the only way to do those things, protect the people, the territory, and the way of life is by cooperating with others. Uh, and it is not a sign of weakness and it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. And I think the biggest mistake that's been going on through this pandemic is kind of thinking that we can do everything by ourselves. Um, I do think the Chinese are gonna have to um, really explore what happened but we are all interconnected in terms of supply lines and um, trying to sort out how we find areas where we can cooperate. And I keep saying this to people, supposing the Chinese now were the only ones that had the vaccine, wouldn't we want it? And so I do think that we have to operate with other countries. <clears throat> all the countries that have very low case numbers have one thing in common. Germany, New Zealand, the leadership. Yes, well, Taiwan, uh, yep. Iceland, Finland, uh, Denmark, they all have women leaders. Uh, and I have been asked why, what do I think about that? Well, I obviously uh, think it makes perfect sense. Uh, and I've, I've thought about what would have made that happen. First of all, I do think that women, as uh, women get into positions of uh, importance, have gotten there because they've worked hard and because they are dependable and because they are not thinking only about how to satisfy their egos uh, and putting themselves forward as the only people that can do it. The other part is that I do think that their women, by virtue of the fact that we do many different things, um, are good at multitasking. Uh, and uh, looking and, and having peripheral vision, frankly. This is a gross generalization, but I think men may have a capability of spending more time on one subject, but I do think that women are good at the peripheral vision. Then the other part, because mostly people have children, they don't want their children to fight with each other and they don't pit one group of children against another group of children, uh, trying to find compromise in a family. Uh, and I think, there is the business about caring and, and really trying to solve problems. And I find it very interesting that those particular countries um, have been able to uh, make some decisions, uh, get them through, um, and understand all, all those things that I said. I think especially, I think about the young woman who's the prime minister of New Zealand, uh, who not only has dealt with uh, the virus, but she also had the right approach to that terrible terrorist killing. Um, and so I do think that uh, there are great talents that women have. Now I'm often asked whether the world would be better if it were only run by women. And to that I say, if you think that you've forgotten high school. I think that what is important is for men and women to work together and share our talents. You think we'd be a little catty if, if all the leaders were women? Well, I do think, as I said earlier, I do think women, we're very judgmental about each other. Uh, and the other thing that I think we have a tendency to do is uh, to project our own uh, lack of confidence um, onto other women. And I'll never forget, I used to travel around with Geraldine Ferraro. She was the first woman 
on a federal ticket. And I, we were somewhere and a woman came up to me and said, how can she deal with a Russian? I can't deal with a Russian. Well, nobody was asking that woman to deal with a Russian. And men don't do that to each other, I think, to kind of be judgmental and project their own sense of inadequacy um, on other men. So the balance is important. And speaking of balance, the, the economy and, and the virus and people trying to balance that, you, you had a, a statement in, in this book, a rule of thumb is that the economy and national security are two issues that matter most. And we've got those two issues plus a virus. Again, if you were still in office as Secretary of State, how would you recommend this be handled? Well, I do think the definition of national security um, is flexible in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and it goes towards um, economic situations and some of the other aspects that I, a way of life and climate and uh, sea lanes and any number of different aspects to it. I do think that we are seeing that health is a national security issue um, because um, obviously it takes a huge toll on, on the human beings. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, it doesn't know, uh, the virus doesn't know any borders. and. Um, the question is whether um, the virus spreads more in developing countries or developed countries, or um, is there something about the way the countries run? And so the national security, I think, is a very broad term. And I would make and make clear that, national, that health is a national security issue. And what is interesting is in the past, um, the, uh, at the UN, the Security Council, um, has in fact in the past taken up issues to do with health, HIV and AIDS, um, or um, Ebola. Um, and so it is viewed as a national security issue. And at the moment, and this is where I would do something different from the current Secretary of State, uh, the U.S. is holding up resolutions because um, the U.S. wants it identified as the Wuhan virus, and of course the Chinese don't want that. Um, and so as the Secretary General is trying to find some kind of overall international way to approach it, the U.S. is not, I don't think, is helping in terms of the way that we are dealing with it and have a narrower view of national security than I would have at this time. I would definitely make health a national security issue, which means uh, in decision making in the U.S. government, that what you do is bring in the experts or the cabinet members from the various departments that you have to work with. And so obviously, um, you know, health, health and human security has to be there, homeland security, um, treasury, any number of different departments, the whole of government. What do you think about pulling out of the World Health Organization and not, not continuing to fund that organization? Well, it's a, a totally counterproductive activity. And let me again go back. I'll do my historical context on this. Okay. Uh, by the way, I loved being at the UN. It was just a terrific time after the end of the Cold War. And um, there were lots of different things that we were able to do and, and could do in a number of different ways. The UN has a number of budgets. One is the regular budget, which are like dues in a club. And the other that I was dealing with when I was there in, in the 90s was the peacekeeping budget. And they are, the budget and the numbers are assessed according to the gross uh, national product of countries by some kind of a percentage. So when I get to the UN, the US was behind in our, um, what we were supposed to be paying for peacekeeping. And Congress unilaterally decided that we would not pay the percentage that we were supposed to uh, pay. And at the same time, I was being asked to work on some reform issues at the UN. And if you're not paying, then you've created an artificial financial crisis um, and you don't have any leverage. And, and I'll never forget this. This led the British, our best friends, in the General Assembly to make a statement they'd waited over 200 years to make, which was representation without taxation. Um, and so what has happened now is we have decided, or President Trump has, that the World, uh, World Health Organization screwed up about the virus and that we were not going to pay what we owe um, and what uh, is determined. And so we are walking out, we will have no leverage 
and the Chinese will take up the space. So it is a counterproductive activity. And one of the things that I have said, and I uh, is just generally that people and institutions in their 70s need a little refurbishing. The UN is 75 years old this year, yeah. uh, and it does need some fixing. And and I think that there are various ways that the agencies and parts of it do need to be looked at from the perspective of uh, 2020, not 1945. And so if we um, abandon ship and our AWOL, then we will have no influence in terms of getting some of those changes. And then just to use the cliche, if the UN didn't exist, we would probably invent something like it today. Mm. Mm -hmm. So would turning that around and paying the taxes again, would, would turning that around and, and funding, putting the funding back in be all that would be needed to solve that disagreement? No, but I think that it would certainly put us at the table rather than having left a vacuum. Um, and it would give us a way of being able to talk about it. I think one of the things that need to happen at the UN, by the way, um, even short of this, is I've thought this for a long time. The UN is based on nation states, but we do know that the private sector, whether they're non-governmental organizations or uh, uh, corporations, play a role. Uh, and they're needed for a number of different aspects, but they can't be brought in at the end. They need to be there as decisions are being made. And I would make some adjustment to be able to have them present earlier. Um, I think that there are, one of the issues is um, how many people from X country get hired. That's one of the aspects of the system, but it also helps if you can figure out a way for intelligence to be shared, and I do think there's some fixes that need to be made, but it requires a, uh, an American uh, representative and an American government that values the partnership that can be developed through uh, working with others. And, and the part that I think is interesting also about the UN, it recognizes the fact that sometimes regional organizations have to uh, complement. So chapter eight of the uh, UN Charter is about the power of regional organizations, whether it's NATO or uh, recognizing that the G8 or G20, G7 exists. So there are ways that uh, uh, the charter can be used, and there are also ways that the nation states are able, working with the Secretary General and the Secretariat, can make some changes that are more um, apt for the, the this century. Is there talk of that? You're still in touch with people who, who make these decisions. Is there well, there about? is, but the U.S. is, I have to say, um, and I find this very painful, uh, I think the behavior of the United States generally internationally at this moment is embarrassing and, and counterproductive. Um, right. And Because we are uh, everything, we want everything our way. Compromise is not a four-letter word. Um, and not everything has to be a zero-sum game. And um, and I think there needs to be some respect. When President Trump has gone to speak at the General Assembly, um, and that is the custom um, each year during the General Assembly session, America is the host country, it's always about sovereignty, sovereignty, and, and how important we are, rather than really thinking about what can be done by cooperating with others. It is not a sign of weakness uh, to cooperate, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out that there's certain issues that require that kind of cooperation. We're gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions later on, but I wanna get to some other storytelling because yep. you have some very funny stories that you tell. Is storytelling, you know that you have that talent. Is it something that worked to your advantage during your career or did it tend to get you into trouble? Both, frankly, um, I mean, um, I do like to tell stories, and I think that sometimes people speak in such uh, professionals and kind of overly complicated sentences with lots of participles, um, and it sometimes makes sense to tell a story and bring people into it. Um, and I think that one of the things that I learned first at the UN, it's a little bit like being in college because you're with the same people in the Security Council all the time, and you get to know each other well. Um, and there are ways to tell stories. Uh, and by the way, back on my pins, yeah. uh, what happened was that um, 
when I became Secretary of State, the Russians were bugging the State Department. Um, and we found the person that was doing it. And we did what diplomats do, which is demarche Moscow. But then I wore, um, the next time I met the Russian foreign minister, Evgeny Primakov at the time, um, I wore a big bug pin and he knew exactly what I was doing. Um, and we were able to, oh, I, if I may, one of the fun things in terms of uh, relationships and stories was that um, when I became Secretary of State, I was told that um, there's this meeting of the ASEAN Regional Forum um, and that um, every country that goes, uh, there are meetings, but then the last night is a time that every country performs a skit. And the people in the State Department said, yes, and the United States does very badly. And I said, well, I'm not going. And they said, you have to go. And I had not wanted to go because they had just taken Burma in the ASEAN and I objected to the way, because it was run by a military government. They said, you have to go. So then the State Department gave me lyrics to Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I said, I am not doing that. So flying over with my delegation, we decided that I would sing, Don't Cry For Me, Asianis. And I got dressed up as Madonna and I was able to do it. And the Russians that year had a really stupid skit where um, Primakov just uh, had a whistle and he was blowing to get the Black Sea, to get, uh, sea Fleet together. So we decided on the margins of important meetings that we would actually do a duet the next year. So we took a story and the story was our version of the West Side Story. Hmm. And we called it the East-West Story. And uh, we made up the lyrics to it. And uh, the rehearsal, we that year we were in Manila and we went to General MacArthur's suite and the Russians brought a lot of vodka and we rehearsed. And then the next day our uh, uh, delegations had a rumble uh, and then I came out singing Yevgeny, Yevgeny, the most beautiful sound I ever heard. And then he came out singing Madeleine Albright, Madeleine Albright, I just met her. So there are stories and they make a difference and they help to kind of um, work the relationship while in fact you are dealing with some very serious problems. You've been on stage performing a number of times. You played drums at the Kennedy Center Honors? No, well that, I mean, what happened was I had gone, this was during the Obama administration, to a state dinner for the Chinese. And what was happening that night, Chris Bode, uh, who plays the trumpet, uh, performed. And then he came to be at the Kennedy Center. And I was with some people who'd helped organize the concert. And they asked me to come down and see him before the performance. So we're there. And all of a sudden, um, he says, when I have somebody who's well known, um, I asked them to play drums with me. Will you do that? And I said, sure. I don't play the drums. <laughs> I, I did play the drums. I had a great time. Uh, and uh, so I, I did that. And then, um, because one of the other things I did in the State Department was I know from my own experience that our best diplomats, uh, diplomacy is jazz. Uh, and I know the difference that jazz musicians made during the Cold War. And so there was a great institute, the Thelonious Monk Institute, that every year had a competition um, for which um, instrument that the high school kids would uh, compete for. So then drums were one year, and they decided that they would honor me. And Aretha Franklin sang Respect to Me, and then I played the drums again. So uh, I love having a good time. And uh, so I do my best to work hard, but also have a good time. I understand there were a couple of gentlemen on a flight with you uh, one time who were slightly inebriated and mistook you for someone else. They knew you were famous, but they didn't know you were you. Well, it was very, I don't know how inebriated, but I was standing there and they're coming in and he and one, this man says to me, oh, this is a, there are two stories. Um, I'll tell one first, which is this man came down the aisle and he says, so you're Margaret Thatcher. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, you are. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not. And he said, you don't have to tell me I'm, uh, you don't have to tell me that you're Margaret Thatcher. I just know you are. But the story that I, uh, you were referring to, I was actually on an airline um, and uh, to get to the bathroom, you had to kind of go through the bar. Um, and there are these men that were slightly inebriated. Um, and all of a sudden, 
this one man kneels down and he said, please bless me. And I said, what? Then he said, just bless me. And I couldn't, you know, was trying to figure out what was going on. He thought I was Mother Teresa. Um, and so uh, I decided I had to go to some other bathroom because I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had some wonderful kind of non-recognition stories. Um, I don't know how many of the people listening to us have been through Heathrow. It's a pretty tough airport yeah. to get through. And for some reason, somebody decided that one time they decided to really pick on me. And I was the chosen person uh, that had to take everything out of the suitcase. And I'm on the floor taking things out. And I never do this, but I finally said, excuse me, but do you know who I am? And the guy looks at me and he says, no, but we can find a doctor who can help you figure it out. And it was hard not to laugh about that. <laughs> he was waiting months to use that line on yeah, somebody. Yeah, you just walked right into it. But anyway. <laughs> now, there is something that you mentioned in the book that happened to you early in, in your, before your career, but, but during your marriage, you were a young woman. And I'll bet this did not come up anywhere in the vetting process that you turned down a job as a tattoo parlor, come on girl. <laughs> oh, do tell. No, I mean, this is, so what happened was, um, one of the things, by the way, just to put this into the right era, I went to a women's college, I went to Wellesley, uh, and uh, our commencement speaker was the Secretary of Defense at the time, Neil McElroy, because his daughter was in our class. And we all remember the speech somewhat differently the wording, but it was basically your most important um, obligation and responsibilities to get married and have children. And the fact that we didn't all kind of walk out was just a sign of what the 50s were like. And so what happened was I waited a long time to get married, three days after graduation. Um, and so my husband was going into the army um, at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And I went home for a while. And then when um, I could go uh, visit, go there to live. I went there and he was in uh, living on base and I was living um, in a, a motel, a converted motel. And I needed to have a car so that I could drive around and um, uh, find a job. So somebody said, well, the, the uh, car rental company is in this tattoo parlor. So I go to the tattoo parlor and that I say I need the car. And so the man said, why do you need it? I said, because I need to find a job. And he said, well, you can have a job here as a come on girl. Uh, and then he saw that I had on a wedding ring. So he changed his mind. But that was one of my first real job offers. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But then I did go and work on a newspaper. And I had so much fun. It was in a town called Rolla, Missouri. Um, and I worked for a paper uh, and they called, it was the Rolla Daily News the world's greatest newspaper, Dash Dash for Rolla. Um, and I did everything. And I uh, took uh, ads. And by the way, one classified ad I just love. Uh, to this day, I remember this man comes in and says, put this ad in, which says, cemetery lot for sale, owner must move, sell at sacrifice. Um, so that, that's not nine that, words. You have uh, to put the whole story yeah, into nine words. Anyway, so so that was great. And then I talked to people that had seen UFOs um, and wrote obituaries and did the social news. And I really learned a lot. And then you'll appreciate this as a journalist. Uh, we moved to Chicago where my husband had a job already and we were having dinner with his managing editor. And he looks at me and he says, so what are you gonna do, honey? I said, I'm gonna work on a newspaper. And he said, I don't think so. You can't work on the same paper as your husband because of labor regulations. And even though there were three other papers in Chicago at the time, and he said, and you wouldn't want to compete with your husband, so go find something else to do, which is, <sighs> did get a job working for Encyclopedia Britannica. And I sometimes say to my younger listeners, that's a book. Um, uh, my job was to read EB, as we called it, for factoids. Um, and so I still remember things like, Ostriches are voiceless, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, because what would happen in newspapers, there was a little space at the bottom of the columns that had to be filled. Right. Um, and so that's what I was doing. And then I had my twins and then I did go back to school. So 
There must have been people through the course of your career, especially as Secretary of State, but in other positions as well. We all have these people. We want to walk out of the room and just throw something. Who did you most want to tell off? Well, um, I think partially, and this is the hard part, these were some foreign people that I was negotiating with. Um, and you have to kind of control yourself. I think partially there is the issue that um, you have some things that you have to say. I mean, um, you have things you go into a country and you're trying to make some agreement, but there's certain things that you have to say. And I would have a trick and I would say, I have come a long way, so I must be frank. Uh, but the person I really did want to throw out of the room was I spent a lot of time on the Balkans. And, uh, and because my life really is a crazy set of uh, uh, coincidences, after we had spent the war in London, uh, my father became ambassador to Yugoslavia. Um, and so the little girl in the national costume um, that gives people flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. Um, but I also, it meant that I learned to, to understand Serbian um, and understood the country because we traveled around a lot. So there I am, accident of having to deal with the Balkans, both at the UN and then as Secretary of State. And I'm meeting with Milosevic and he is giving me this whole long history of the Serbs. And I said, I know the history of the Serbs. And I said very frankly to him that my father used to say, that if he weren't a Czech, he'd be happy to be a Serb. And he'd say, so why are you so awful? And I said to the Serbs, and I said, because you're doing dreadful things um, in terms of uh, killing people. And so I really did want to kind of throw him out of the room. Mm -hmm. Conversely, who, with whom were you most starstruck? Starstruck? Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, in many ways, many people, frankly, I yeah. have not monogamous. Uh, so one of the things that happened was I really did become very good friends with the people that were foreign ministers um, who became very, very good friends of mine. And one of them that, uh, and let me just uh, again shows how things changed. I invented something, uh, believe it or not, was the art of the diplomatic telephone conference call. Hmm. Uh, and I did not know that. during the war in Kosovo, I had um, a daily conversation with what's known as the Quint, the British, French, Germans, Italians, and me, about what was going on on an open line. And the person that I, is, continues to be one of my closest friends that I grew to know well during this whole period was Joschka Fischer, who was the German foreign minister. Uh, he was one of the most interesting people because he um, had uh, been, uh, somebody that was kind of a revolutionary in his day and somebody that was uh, opposed to people that he didn't like. He said that as he was growing up that he figured that most of the people that were had been in authority during the war had done terrible things and so, um, you know, or collaborated. So we're talking on the phone about uh, what was going on in Kosovo at the time. And he's the only one who could say things like, that's what the Nazis did um, when we were talking about ethnic cleansing. And um, he is somebody that I admire greatly because he's incredibly smart um, and also um, true to his principles. Um, mm. Also loved the, the Brits. I mean, um, uh, and what I did, by the way, when we were out of office, um, I got a call from um, uh, Robin Cook, who'd been the British Foreign Secretary, and said he'd just come out of a meeting and people were saying terrible things about the US. This was in the early 2000s and he said, do something. And then I got another phone call from um, the former Dutch foreign minister with the same message. So I decided that I would form a group of former foreign ministers. And its official name is the Aspen Ministers Forum because they're the, the umbrella organization. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. So that's why I'm deciding who I like the most. And, we and you get together, it. you get together regularly. We and we, yeah. we just did, and we had to do it virtually uh, this time about a month right. ago. We were going to yeah. be down, and we really are good friends. We don't talk from our national positions, um, and we uh, do, in fact, do a lot of things together. Um, 
And one of them, for instance, is Lloyd Axworthy, the Canadian, former Canadian Foreign Secretary, who's just done the most amazing thing on refugees with George Papandreou, the former Greek foreign minister. Or, um, And we really do talk a lot. And I, I just love it in terms of the friendships. I've expanded it because there weren't a lot of women foreign ministers when I was around. So I've gotten a, a whole cohort of women foreign ministers now with me. Oh, good, good. I just have a couple more questions and then I know the people who are in the room with us, even though we can't see them, they will have a lot of questions too. You write in this book, uh, the phrase, the NATO of my dreams. What does the NATO of your dreams look like? And what do we have to do to make this organization viable? Well, it's interesting because it has been the most important uh, military alliance in the history of the world. I do think other parts of it, however, it is an alliance or supposed to be an alliance of democracies, uh, that more would be done about that in terms of having, uh, just, you know, making sure what troubles me a lot is what's happened with some of the NATO allies that now do have uh, authoritarian governments, the, the Hungarians, for instance, uh, um, and the Poles, some the Turks. Uh, and I think that a NATO of our dreams, of my dreams, would be one that was able to deal with um, uh, injustices inside countries. One of the things that we talk about is the responsibility to protect, the understanding also of what a cyber and everything does. So I think it would be an organization um, that has a strategic concept that is able to respond to the threats that are there now, to go back on some of the, the threats change. We talked about health issues and, um, and I do think it's a, a great organization. Um, I don't think that we ought to go around acting as if we are victims. Uh, we are, it's a partnership and that's what I would like to see more, a partnership. It's another organization that needs to change as it ages then? I think some, I mean, what's interesting is I was asked to, uh, what happened was there, there was a new secretary general on the 60th anniversary of NATO, and there was a decision that there would be a group of experts that would help him figure out what the next things to do were. Uh, at that stage, there were 28 countries in NATO. He decided that only 12 countries would be on um, this group of experts, uh, automatically irritating 16 countries. And then he asked me to chair it. Uh, and what was interesting was at that stage, what we were talking about is that NATO had primarily been doing things that we call out of area uh, of non-member states in the Balkans and Afghanistan. And what were the lessons out of that? And whether cyber, a cyber attack was also an Article 5 attack that required uh, uh, common defense. And so it's interesting how now, as they're looking at a strategic concept, again, everything's different because of the actions of the Russians um, in and around Ukraine. We have sent, uh, there are forces that are in Eastern Europe in area uh, and trying to figure out how they deal with that or what they do about what's going on um, in the Baltic Sea um, with um, uh, climate change and melting of waterways. And so it, it's a, um, an organization that does need to always be adept at what are the current issues and how to work with other partners. As a professor, I, I love what you said about teaching here. Don't you love the way people quote lines from your book right back to you? More than any other activity, teaching embodies my sense of who I am and what I aim to be. What does that well, mean? I what do you aim to be? Well, um, I, I aim to, to uh, let me just put it this way. It took me a long time to become who I am. Um, and uh, to try to understand what I've learned um, and talk about decision making, how not to brainwash my students and how to deal with them in total honesty and respect their uh, knowledge and interest. Um, I uh, have made very clear, we all quote Robert Frost all the time. Um, and it's basically the older I am, the younger are my teachers. Um, and I really do love teaching and it makes me stretch my mind and learn new things and put them into historical context and then respect those um, that I'm uh, that I'm teaching more than ever frankly because I've just been doing it remotely 
and they have been able to, I, I do a game simulation, which is so much fun. And they did it this time remotely. And they did something remarkable. I always set up a scenario. This time it was about Venezuela. Um, and then I create a problem. And there was an immediate issue of an, I made this up, an American ship that was seized by the Venezuelan military. And it was on its way to deliver humanitarian assistance to the refugees. And my students took that problem and turned it into an opportunity, which is what you want. Right. Um, in terms of dealing with some of the political problems among Cuba, Colombia, and Venezuela. And it was just a person mm. using a crisis for an opportunity. Um, so I do love teaching. And, um, and partially also, uh, when my father uh, came to the United States, he said there is nothing better than to be a professor in a free country. And mm. one of the things that happened, we were refugees. And my mother had a job as a secretary in the Denver Public Schools. And she would get up early in the morning and take the bus and come home exhausted. And my father, the former ambassador, would do the dishes and we'd clean house together. And I would always say to my father, you're a professor and all you do is work three hours a week. So we have to do this. Now I realize it's a lot more than working three hours a week. It's a lot more. Yeah. Madam Secretary, I could talk to you all day, but the fact that Rivka has popped back up here on the screen means that <laughs> the other listeners and viewers to this conversation have right. their Happy own too. questions. So thank, thank, you. thank you for answering uh, mine. And now let's hear what they have to say. Yeah. Okay. And we have so many questions and so little time and we voted, but we're going to do a combination of um, of those that receive the most votes. And I'm going to take it because a little privilege um, for the last question uh, that didn't get as many votes, but I think it's important. So, and you may have covered this, um, but I think, I think I'll go ahead and ask it. What actions would you recommend in today's climate to rebuild the goodwill of our allies? Well, I do think that I would do a lot because I think that um, it is the most important aspect. We cannot, as powerful as the United States is, we cannot deal with the problems of today alone. Um, and I went to an interesting conference, uh, believe it or not, in February in Munich, the Munich Security Conference, where the U.S. was really like on another planet. Um, uh, Secretary Pompeo came and the Secretary of Defense came and they were saying something that made it didn't even resonate with the other people that were there in terms of what their needs were. And I think that I would spend more time trying to figure out how to be a partner, um, whether it's through um, organizations such as NATO or um, the G20 or whatever, and um, decide not that everybody's taking advantage of us, but that we're stronger when we work with them and not go in and lecture them all the time. Um, and so try to, the art of diplomacy is putting yourself into the other country's shoes and trying to come up with a win-win situation. And it's gonna be a big job. And I can tell you this, in case you haven't guessed, is if there's another four more years of Trump, it will, we, they can put up with another few months. They cannot put up with another four years. And the United States not being able to be part of a solution instead of, haranguing people about the way that we have to do it our way or the highway. Thank you. All right, the next question. What are your recommendations for handling the current pandemic crisis? Well, um, I think the most important thing is for us to understand um, the scientific aspect of this and to listen to the experts on this. Um, I think that there, we have learned a lot about the pandemic um, in terms of the spread of it and a number of different aspects. And I think we have to focus on trying to get a vaccine. Uh, that is the most important part. Uh, and then I think, and this is the really, really hard part, and I've been thinking about this, is that there clearly is a linkage between health issues and the economy. And I was talking, by the way, we were talking about one of my former foreign minister friends um, is the man uh, from Nigeria, who in our last discussion actually about this said, 
we have to figure out how to be for life and a livelihood at the same time. And that's not easy, is to try to figure out how the economic issues and the health issues go together without threatening and opening up too early when uh, we know that there are going to be further waves of this. Science is the epitome of trying to sort out a problem. It's not guts, it's science. Thank you. Joyce asked, the world is in such turmoil now. Are there any new policies, foreign or domestic, that give you hope? Well, I think that um, actually the young people and their capability, what I, I was thinking about this, we were talking with Donna about uh, my game simulation mm -hmm. and what I found interesting, uh, we have been quite critical, I think, of young people for always being online uh, or not understanding what privacy is about or um, kind of uh, thinking that they're owed something. And I think in bottom ways, they are in many ways more prepared for the technological advances. Um, and I think that they they want to make a difference. And I think it's our uh, responsibility to uh, respect their views and to make sure that they understand the role they play in democracy. Thank you. Carrie wants to know, what professional accomplishment are you most proud of? And are there any things that you regret? Um, well, what I'm most proud of is, in fact, uh, something to do with foreign policy. And again, uh, my interest in the Balkans is what we did in Kosovo, uh, because uh, I felt that we had been a little slow on Bosnia, and all of a sudden I'm Secretary of State, and, um, and I wanted to, I saw what was going on, and I wanted to make a difference. The only problem is the Secretary of State can say anything, but has no airplanes. So, <laughs> interesting was trying to figure out, first of all, how to work within our own government, um, because we had to work with the Pentagon, obviously, and uh, tried to figure it out. President Clinton wanted to do something, uh, which made all the difference. Um, and But then at the beginning, everything went wrong. The weather was bad, uh, the Serbs put out decoys, and then I came into my office, and all of a sudden my exec says, sit down. And I said, what's the matter with you? He said, just sit down. So he said, and we have just bombed the Chinese embassy by mistake. So everything was going wrong. Um, and then uh, it was my fault, they said. It was called Madeline's War. And then when we won, other people took some credit. But uh, the bottom line is uh, there's now a whole generation of young women in Kosovo whose first name is Madeline. And then President Clinton and I went there this spring. Uh, and you've never seen a country that was so grateful for what we'd done hundreds of American flags and thousands of people out. And so I'm very, very proud of Kosovo. But I also, there's a lesson in that, which is Americans think if we do something, it's done. Uh, sometimes things take longer and they need our attention a long time. My big regret um, in terms of my official life, and although I was UN ambassador, not secretary, is what we didn't do in Rwanda. Uh, because, and I can explain why we didn't, but um, it really was a, a um, it was a, what I call volcanic genocide after the airplane of the uh, Hutu president was shot down. Um, and we didn't, I think we probably couldn't have gotten there fast enough, but we should have done something. And so that is something that I'm really sorry about. And President Clinton to this day, because uh, we all stay in touch, says, well, what, did, what didn't we do? Why didn't we do it? Um, and there are always, if you look back, regrets in terms of something that you think you could have or should have done. And you have to remember the circumstances that were in place at the time. And I teach about that, by the way, for the historical context. Thank you. Um, I really like this question. So even though it didn't get a lot of votes, I think it's an important one. Would you please share about your mentors? What lessons did you learn to repeat and um, not to repeat from your mentors? Well, um, I think that obviously my parents were my greatest mentors. And one of the things that I would like to say about that, because I write about what it was like to be in England during the war, but I hadn't kind of focused enough on the following thing, is that they must have felt um, very lonely. And my mother didn't speak English, my father did, but they were in a very small community of refugees. and. And I was thinking that they had no control over the bombs that were falling. 
The only thing they had control over was their behavior and their mood. And I think that is something that translates now because we don't have control about how the virus started, but we do have some control over how we behave uh, and our mood. So my parents were the mentors. But the part that's interesting, and I did go to a women's college and I had some fabulous uh, women professors, but the truth be told is my mentors were some uh, powerful political men, Senator Edmund Muskie, who was the Senator from Maine and then chairman of the budget committee and was um, made very clear that being called a politician was not a bad word. Um, and, um, and, I, uh, and then Zbigniew Brzezinski was my professor at Columbia and he was a mentor. Walter Mondale was a mentor. Um, uh, I could say Eleanor Roosevelt, but I didn't know her, only Hillary channeled. Uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, but she clearly played a very large role in creating the organizations um, that, I, that I worked with. But I do think men can be mentors to women. I'm very glad there are more women mentors these days. That's a great answer. Thank you. What do you consider the essential background and or characteristics for a Secretary of State? Well, First of all, to respect the people that actually work at the State Department. Uh, you, in order to do diplomacy, you have to have diplomats. Um, and there are people who have devoted their lives to um, that career and that think about what is good for the United States. And so I do think you can't do anything by yourself. I think that's the point that mm -hmm. you come in and you need a team. I also think that you have to have a sense about what America's role in the world is um, and how um, uh, we are, continue to be the most powerful country in the world. But what for me is so essential is something that we've talked about is the importance of partnerships and understanding that in order to work with other countries, you need to know where they're coming from uh, and to have respect for them. And then I think to understand what America's about, what our value system is. and. I have recently been somewhere where I had to describe myself in six words. And I said, worried optimist, problem solver, and grateful American. And I am a grateful American. And I think that um, I have said, when we, I came to the United States November 11th, 1948, on the SS America and, say, and sailed by the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is weeping at the moment because we have misunderstood that America is based on diversity. And one of the things uh, that I love doing is giving people their naturalization certificates. And the first time I did it was July 4th, 2000 at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home. Since I had his job, I thought I could do this. And so I'm giving this man his naturalization certificate and he walks away and I hear him say, can you believe that I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State? And I went up to him and said, can you believe that a refugee is Secretary of State? And that is why I'm proud to be an American and think that we know what we need to do in terms of making sure that our value system uh, is projected and not that we're building walls. Thank you. That That's beautiful. We've uh, been privileged to host some ceremonies here at Sacramento Public Library. We have a lovely space. And it is one of the most moving experiences. If you've never yeah. been in a room with hundreds of people who are becoming U.S. citizens, it, it's amazing. Thank you. I, I really, that's such a beautiful yeah. statement. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Um, and very moving. Um, all right. I have a couple of questions that I think you talked about your brooches at the beginning of the conversation with Donna. Did you say which your favorite one is, or do you have a favorite? Well, I have two that are favorites. One is a ceramic heart um, that uh, my daughter made. Um, and so somebody says, how old is your daughter? Well, she's now in her 50s. But she said, Mom, you have to tell people I made it when I was five years old. <laughs> sure that There are a lot of parents that have that kind of a pin. Um, and I've always worn it on Valentine's Day. Uh, it's just that now my uh, pin show has been kind of uh, put aside and I'm gonna give it all to the State Department. But um, the other of my favorite pin is what I call my Katrina pin. 
And I went down to New Orleans after Katrina, and I went to the World War II Museum there. And uh, then I went to a dinner, and I'm at the dinner, and this young man comes up with a little box, and um, he said, my father is sitting over there. He earned two Purple Hearts uh, during uh, the war, and, um, and uh, he gave this pin to our mother on their 50th wedding anniversary, and she died as a result of Katrina and we want you to have the pin. I said, I can't possibly accept it. And he said that this is what we want to do. Please accept it. And so I have it. And I thought from those two pieces, they are uh, inanimate objects, but they carry an awful lot of meaning and emotion. And so those are my favorite pins. And I have gone around my pin collection. I always try to make foreign policy less foreign. And so they all have great stories. And the State Department has started a diplomacy museum, and I decided that I'm giving the whole collection to um, the State Department Diplomacy Museum. Oh, that's Good. wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to ask, I think we have time for one last question. You've been just so generous with your time, and, and we are so lucky here in the Sacramento region that, that you joined us this evening. Um, it's your birthday. Happy birthday. That's from, uh, Dan I hope I'm saying it right, Daniel. And um, Daniel would like to know, Madam Secretary, what are some of your favorite books that you would like to recommend? Let's tie it back to the library. Okay. Well, <laughs> first of all, I know I do love War and Peace. I think that it's an amazing book. I know that uh, when the people read it as teenagers, the boys read it for the battles and the girls read it for the love story. Um, but as one can find various parts in terms of, and I use it in my class in terms of the, the way that people see their individual roles. So I recommend it. I, I don't, I'm not kind of a, somebody like Tolstoy who is a fatalist, but um, I do like the book. I have been reading uh, David Rubenstein's book, An American Story, that talks about American historical figures. Um, and, uh, and I very much like um, the uh, things, Michael Beschloss, who's been writing about presidents during the war. I do love reading about American history. One of the books that I went back and was reading is A Gentleman in Moscow, which is a mystery story, but it's germane at the moment because it's in 1922. This man was kind of uh, uh, ca not captured, but he had to stay at the Metropole Hotel. He couldn't come out. Um, and uh, so I can identify with that at the moment. But also, I happen to have stayed at the Metropole Hotel in 1984 when Geraldine Ferraro, I took to Moscow for her first trip there. And we stayed there and we got some vodka and caviar and had a good time. But, uh, <laughs> it is fun. Uh, and I, I do like to read historical books. Um, and so... Uh, there, there's an awful lot that can be read about American history at the moment. And, uh, and I, uh, John Meacham is always just terrific in terms of the way he sees America's role. And then it's kind of fun uh, to read um, about the, uh, the president is missing, Jim Patterson and, okay. and Bill Clinton. So lots of things to read. Did you have a favorite book as a child? Well, uh, it's interesting because I basically, as a child, read some Czech stories. And there are a, a, sto a whole set of stories about firebugs uh, and, um, and various things that they did. And so I, I read a lot of Czech uh, stories. Thank you. Well, we are at the official end of our time. And I hate to say goodbye because this has been one of the best and most memorable hours of my time as a librarian and certainly as uh, a director of Sacramento Public Library. We can't thank you enough. Donna, we can't thank you enough. Oh, my part was easy. I got to talk yeah. with Madam Secretary and hear these <laughs> fabulous stories. Thank you. And we hope what? you'll come back to Sacramento someday. I'd be happy to. And this was so much fun. You guys were great. and. I thank you for the questions and kind of the whole sense about exchanging views and listening to my crazy stories and love them. Uh, and thank you very, very much for your generosity. Thank and you. Thanks.
and to everybody that was there. And I want to thank the uh, more than 560 people who joined us tonight. Um, we wouldn't have physical space to hold all of you. So uh, we're very grateful that you joined our virtual space. And Madam Secretary, again, thank you so much. And everybody in the audience, thank you. Uh, thank you for being such a great audience. Come back to the library. We have uh, some suggested reading for you now, courtesy of uh, Madam Secretary. And uh, don't forget to use all the other wonderful uh, resources we have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank Thanks. Happy Thank birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. We're Thank so you. grateful. So much fun. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. All right. I'm going to, I guess, end the broadcast. And Donna, thank you so much. My pleasure. Enjoyed and every minute. This was just incredible. What a, what a great event. And thank you. And thank Cap Radio for letting, letting us borrow you for tonight. And I hope we get to do this again. All right. Good night, everyone.